Um, and welcome to what's new in the Revit 2013 courseware. Um, we are really glad to have you here today. My name is Martha Hollowell. I'm a senior instructional designer for Ascent, and I'm a Revit Architecture 2012 certified professional, which means I took the test. We'll talk about that a little bit later, too. Um, each year, I write and update training courseware for Revit Architecture, Revit MEP, and Revit Structure. Um, this is what's used by trainers and students around the world, and I heard earlier that we have some people from not just North America, but South America, and I'm sure there's others as well, so we do welcome you today. Just a little bit about me so you can know where I'm coming from. Um, I have a degree in architecture, and I practice architecture for a number of years, and to date myself, I actually used a pen and pencil and slide roll and all those sort of things. So before I got onto the computer, um, I did CAD consulting, and I've been a tra I was a trainer for about 10 years. Um, I started writing because what was out there needed help. So we actually, now I'm a, I write full time. I started with AutoCAD. I also have done AutoCAD architecture, and I've been um, writing about Revit since version 5, so a number of years now. I find Revit the most powerful program available for building design. It gets more powerful every year, and I've just loved it since I first loaded it on my computer. So I hope that all of you do as well and um, are interested in seeing what's, what's new and what's new for us too. Well, I want to cover two things today. Um, first of all, I'm going to do a quick overview at the process that I actually take when we get a software upgrade and then put it into our training guides. Um, and then I'm going to talk about what's specifically new in our Revit training guides so that you can have an idea of, of what to look for when you put, pick up one of the 2013 training guides. So first of all, the process of updating our Revit training guides. From the moment I have access to the latest revision of the software, I review all of the what's new documents that Autodesk sends. Um, sometimes we get some and sometimes we don't get that much. So I work directly in the software as well and start um, just kind of checking it out. What's this? How's this? Does this look different? Um, occasionally I uncover a few undocumented features, um, which I then tell Autodesk. So <laughs> it's a lot of fun. Um, I also take all that information that I gather and I summarize it all in a single spreadsheet. Uh, so this is an example of what I did this year. And you can see I've got my architecture over here. So there's the, the various books that are all about the architecture. Here's our structure books. Um, here's our MEP books that we're looking at. And you can see here I have them, and that actually – covers all of them, and again, I'll talk more about that a little bit later. Another thing I do is I constantly gather information from our customers. So this is something that I do throughout the year, um, and then come in and I make corrections um, once I get all of these. This is a fairly simple one. As you can see, I uh, have it uh, U instead of UN for units to bring up the units thing. Um, but I appreciate how this person told me exactly where and what needed to be done. So I know it's BIM management. It's page 14, 19, 419 and number 7. Um, really helpful. Um, we do appreciate these kind of com comments. So do feel free to send me your comments um, and whatever things that you can find. If you even uh, even if you find something like a you know misspelling, you know we want to we want to change those. Uh, also, if you have any um, suggested changes for content or order, you know, we, we appreciate the feedback. We want to know how you're actually using this in your teaching environment. Another thing is I review all the con content, not just the new features or things that need to be fixed. From there, I might realize that a topic could be presented better or I might move it to a different place. Um, this is something new in our Revit architecture book this year. Uh, I had covered room tags and therefore rooms in the tags chapter, but in a subset of tags. Um, it's such a powerful tool. I've now pulled it out to its own topic, and so you can see there I'm covering rooms and room tags um, as a separate topic. 
ethic. Another thing that we do is our practices are always evolving. Um, for a number of years ago, I used this, this little two-story architect's office as the model for our Revit Architecture Fundamentals practices. But a lot of people were designing mid-rises and high-rises, and so a two-story office building wasn't as applicable to what they were doing. So I changed the practices to a big hotel project, as you can see here. Here's our big hotel project. It fits the multi-story needs of many clients without sacrificing any of our teaching examples. Once all my work is done, I send it out for a technical review, and once those changes are applied, it goes on to editorial review, and then we release it. Um, as you know, the number of Revit titles has expanded over the years, so here we go. Here's all our Revit titles we have now. Um, so each year we look, you know, what is the sales data, what is the most important one to put out first, almost always fundamentals. Um, of each of the, the flavors. Um, we do have a roadmap. This is on our ascented.com website. You can see the roadmap. And as you can see, I have a busy October coming. So here's my October site and structure and structure advanced. We're working on those right now. So now, what's new in our Revit training guides? Um, we, I'm going to talk about two different things here. One is new features that we include in each of our training guides, no matter what software you're using. And then I'm going to talk about new features and content in our Revit training guides specifically. The first thing you'll see is there's a, a, a basic update in our basic updates is our class files page. So instead of a CD, which we included in our, our manuals earlier, you can now download the class files directly from our STP site. This allows us to ensure that you get the most up-to-date files. And if we have to make a change, we can also do that. So we might update that file, say a, a file is missing or something needed to be corrected in a file. We can reload that up there. Um, and then you can come and grab it again. So if you do experience a problem with files and you've reported it, you can download it again um, once it's fixed. Of course, like previous releases, I've added the new in 2013 and the enhanced in 2013 icons wherever there's updated information. So you can quickly identify your new modified tools and processes. Um, so for people who are used to using the 2012 software, this makes it really obvious where you can find new, new things. One of the most important things that we added this year to our training guides is learning objectives. You can see that they're going to be right up here at the top of each, each topic. Um, they tell, tell you clearly what you're going to be covering in that particular topic. And so they can be very useful when the students look back on what they've learned on a particular topic or chapter. And if you are creating lesson plans, these are the objectives that you would add into your lesson plan. Um, you can see that by the end of this topic, you'll know how to add tags in 2D and 3D views, and you will know how to load tags that are needed for projects. So in each of these, um, there will be at least one objective in each topic. Another change is the chapter review questions. Um, we have now based them on our learning objectives, and we've changed them to multiple choice. So this gives anyone who prefers to wrap up the lectures with a quiz the ability to do that. Or you can still use it as a basis of a group discussion. Because they reference the learning objectives in each chapter, we've increased the number of questions in many cases. So in the past, it was kind of like you know, five questions or so for each chapter. Um, but now we have them, they match up not exactly one for one to the learning objectives, but pretty close. A lot of people use our training guides to prepare for the um, Revit Architecture Certification Exam. So we now include an appendix over here 
where it has the exam topic, the exam objectives. These are the ones that you actually get from Autodesk. And then we put in our training guide and chapter right here so you can see where you have those. Um, then in the topics, if there's one that matches up, you can see here is creating roofs, um, certification topic of modeling, objectives create elements such as floors, ceilings, or roofs. Well, here's how to do that particular one. So you'll need to read through this one to be able to match part of that certification objective. Last year, we had copies of our manuals in print and ebook form available for people to look through at the Autodesk University Certification Lab. So that was for people who were preparing to take the exam at Autodesk University. Um, we, are, we are going to have them there again this year. So if you are going to Autodesk University and taking the certification exam, um, take a look at the, the prep room where you can uh, look through the books and make sure you're covering the things you need for the exam. So beyond the basic changes to training guides, there are several things that, are, that we made specifically to changes because of the Revit software itself. And one of the biggest changes that impacts all of our books is the Autodesk Revit 2013 one box, sometimes you may have heard it called that, the one box program that comes with the building design suite. So instead of installing a copy of Revit Architecture, another one of Structure, another one of NEP, there's actually one software package that includes all the features from each discipline. So some firms and training facilities might be using this on their computers, so you need to know how to use it along with our training guides. At the beginning of each of our Revit training guides, we have added in the setting up the interface. Um, so this is if you are using the um, one box version, we tell you how to set it up so that the students will see the discipline specific. And in each of our cases, we actually try to take the pictures for the most part from the discipline specific uh, software so that it, you, know, you don't have any problem understanding what's there. Um, if you are not, you, if you are using the discipline-specific software, you can just skip this. You know, it's not needed. But if you do have uh, the building suite version, uh, do check this out so you can set it up and know what's happening. There are also lots of changes here and there because of this modified interface. Um, in some cases, you'll barely notice a difference. But in both the discipline-specific and in the building suite. Uh, look, watch out for the new names for the Home tab, uh, and also in the Families, the Create tab. Those aren't used anymore. They are now specific um, architecture structure systems. Or sorry, Home is actually turned to Create. <laughs> sorry, in the in the um, Family section. As you know, there's also a lot of overlap between Revit MEP, Revit Architecture, and Revit Structure. So I gathered the best information from each of our training guides where the concepts overlapped, and I added them together in the text. Then, for each one, I went back and I modified the graphics and the examples to match each discipline. So where it absolutely overlaps, you're actually going to see the exact same content, but where there's a specific example and where our graphics are, we take those from the discipline specific. This makes it a lot easier if you teach two or more of the discipline specific Revits, and it keeps a consistent format throughout all of our guides. Um, you'll see this a lot in the early chapters of the fundamentals class, for like this is an example of part of the introduction um, to them in Revit. The interface will be similar, views are similar, um, your drawing and editing tools for the most part are very similar. Um, and then there's a lot of overlap in the construction documents phase, uh, sheets, annotation, tags, schedules, um, as, as well as the tools that are used to create details. So while your details look a whole lot different, the actual tools you use are not different between the different um, disciplines. Another thing that might be helpful for you to know um, for structure and for MEP, we uh, have 
we've included linking and coordination near the beginning of each of the training guides because they are critical to starting a project um, for Revit uh, structure and Revit MEP. Uh, for the Revit structure manual, that means we change things a little bit uh, around the order of what's, of what's covered um, so that you actually start a project based on a linked model uh, early on in the process now. For architectural models, by the way, for linking and coordination, um, we cover that in collaboration tools because the Revit architecture uses it differently um, if you're going to use a linking. Another example of the changes that impact all of our different flavors of Revit is our material browser, as you can see here, and the material editor. It has a very different look, so anytime you're using materials, you're not going to get the materials dialog box, but you will get this now, the new materials browse, material browser, and I do that all the time too. It's not materials anymore, it's material. Um, so for you that are teaching and trying to use the exact right name, there, there it is, Material Browser. In the training guides, you're going to see something like this uh, presented in different ways. So in, in this case, you'll see the exact same um, dialog boxes no matter what flavor you're in, but you are going to um, use them differently. For Revit Architecture, the focus is on the material and how it looks for rendering. So you, you know, have a nice look of the stone that's here. For Revit MEP, there's new thermal data information that impacts the heating and cooling load calculations for HVAC. So there, that's how you, you know, want to know more about the material browser. Um, and there's also structural properties that impact structural analysis in the materials. And if you're doing energy analysis, uh, the material properties also impact how the materials in the elements, such as walls and windows, apply to the overall environmental design of the building. So here's a very important um, use. You won't, you'll see it in different places, um, but it does come out throughout all of the disciplines. Okay, let's take a look at some discipline-specific updates. I'm not going to cover each and every update there is. I'm just going to give you some examples of what you might find um, as you look through those discipline-specific updates. Uh, I went through, as, as you saw before, I used my little spreadsheet. I made sure that those went in. I have another spreadsheet. I like spreadsheets. They help me keep track of things. Um, so in this case, I found that the new fabric reinforcement um, thing that you have in Revit structure was an important addition, and it was an important enough not for me for me not to just put it in the topic, but also to put it right on into a practice. So here you can see um, I've added task six to one of our practices on reinforcement, and we are teaching how to do that fabric reinforcement and doing a practice with it. All right, MEP. Um, there are some updates, such as the systems browser and MEP. Um, this, this is a, a column setting, so you can actually uh, get your system browser looking the way you want it to. Um, it's not critical to the use of the software, but it is helpful. So in that sort of, in this case, I would just put it in a hint. Um, you can gauge the interest of the and the need of the people in your classes and then teach them specifically this, they might want to know more. You might have a group that, um, oh, I want to uh, do some more customization to the interface, and so you could teach that. Uh, or you could just leave it later for the students to read. Um, items such as this, this one's a new one in 2013, but a lot of times if someone sends me in a tip or some feedback, hey, I use this tool this way, um, I also incorporate those into some hints. Uh, so as I said earlier, we do listen to your comments and your re requests. Then, of course, there are the big uh, game-changing updates that come time to time in Revit. Um, this year, in Revit Architecture, the way you create stairs has been changed significantly. So this whole chapter and exercise basically needed to be rewritten, 
So you'll see that's a completely new one. If you are just getting ready to teach your Revit Architecture 2013 Fundamentals, take time to look through this one because it is new. Um, by the way, the stairs are easy to use once you get used to them, if you first look at it and get all concerned, what is this? Um, but I ha you can teach just the basics, but I also included a lot of the bells and whistles of the command, so you can do very complicated stairs as well. And again, not all of this is needed by every student, so take a look at your class, gauge your class, to see how much needs to be taught. Okay, a few other updates. Um, those were all in our fundamentals manual. Um, but there are a few other updates to entire books that can impact your use of our manuals. So, for example, um, BIM management, we had a lot of people ask, where are families? Well, here we have actually named, renamed our BIM management class to template and family creation. So it's right there in the um, title of the class so you can know where you need to go to teach people about family creation. Um, in, in this case also, um, this is not, not new this year, but it's last year, and it might be that you hadn't noticed it before, haven't used it. We created the BIM management class so that it can be taught in any of the disciplines. So you will see here's our familiar bookcase. If you've taught any of the family classes, you um, do a bookcase. But we've now added in a heat pump for our NEP and a, a structural column for our structural users. And there are also specific things that you might need to have um, in your um, structural class and MEP class, some certain things that you want to teach in families. So we have additional practices for each of those as well. Oh, and another thing that um, was kind of neat in the BIM class, um, it was a small update, but I learned it at Autodesk University. Um, so here's a little plug for Autodesk University. I took an interior design class and um, using Revit and interior design. And one of the good tips that came out was instead of using a full 3D family in every instance that you need to put something in, um, that just will make such a huge project. You can have a 2D family with all the parameters that are used in schedules and things that you need there and insert those where a full 3D family isn't needed. Um, so I added that. I don't have a slide for that right now. But I did add that in our um, BIM class, so a good little trick I learned at AU last year. Um, one other thing that we did add this year in um, our our entire book, we added a Revit Structure Fundamentals and Metric. So here we go. Um, that's actually our fabric reinforcement here uh, information. So new information, but also, as you can see, um, it is in uh, a metric as well. So if you, if you need to teach a mixed class, you can do it. Our, our um, metric and our um, imperial unit classes are basically the same. So if you do have a class where you're teaching both, that can work. Um, and, of course, for our metric-only users, you now have your own guide. And finally, this, you can see, looks like a little bit different slide. Um, to wrap up what's new in our Revit training guides, we've added overheads to the instructor tools for all of our fundamentals classes, not just Revit architecture. This one's one for Revit structural, as you can see, creating structural grids um, and what you're doing these. So these overheads um, also include our learning objectives, and then there's slides for the topics and subtopics that you're most likely going to want to show to your students. Um, they can be helpful as another visual aid as you start talking about each topic and before you move into a demonstration. So they aren't the actual teaching tool in terms of step-by-step, step, but they are another visual aid to help you get engage your students and get, get them working. Well, as I said earlier, we really do appreciate customer feedback on our training guides, uh, and you can contact us and keep connected to us through these avenues. And I want to thank you for joining me today, and I hope that you enjoyed this presentation.